Okay, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, my name is Lin Zhao. I work with the team NetWet on oil spill response research in ExxonMobil. Uh, team is uh, not available today, so uh, my colleague uh, Douglas Mitchell and I will substitute him to host uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can run it as smooth as the team does. <laughs> so, um, if you are hearing this, uh, this is the dispersion webinar series. Uh, we have a total 10 webinars, nine weeks on dispersion topics and one week on herders, uh, which uh, was held last week. Uh, if uh, you missed that, uh, we also have a recording uh, we'll uh, distribute soon. Uh, this is a uh, webinar week five on dispersion the topic. Um, we have uh, three very interesting talks today. Uh, I will get on those uh, in a second. Uh, but first, I want to uh, briefly introduce why we are conducting this uh, webinar series. Uh, so the objective is to um, bring together uh, diverse uh, groups interested in this topic, including uh, academia, industry, government, uh, oil, spill uh, oil spill responders, and the consultants, so that we can have a broad range of uh, pers perspectives uh, together uh, on dispersion use of oil spill response and uh, in situ burn uh, enabled by herders. We also want to promote the industry's uh, all tools uh, in the toolbox approach to oil spill response planning. Uh, dispersion is an important tool in the toolbox, um, uh, especially useful for uh, large uh, offshore uh, oil spills. So today uh, we have uh, three very interesting talks about the research activities in uh, three organizations. And Dr. Ken Lee will talk about the dispersion herder related research at uh, MPRI, uh, including the plans for the upcoming field trials. Uh, Dr. Melissa Partika will talk about grant dispersion and herder related activities. We also have uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Susan Robert and Dr. Kelly Ostwick uh, from the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine to talk about their uh, dispersion study and the upcoming book, Oil in the Sea 4. Um, so the way uh, we run the webinar will be like uh, sections in conference. Uh, so speakers will talk about uh, 20 minutes, then 10 minutes uh, for question, uh, and then we'll go to the uh, next speaker. Um, the attendees will ask a que questions uh, through the Q&A button in the Zoom, uh, and then uh, we'll read the questions to the speakers. Uh, any questions that are not answered during the Q&A period will go through the rest of questions at the end of that webinar. Uh, normally, we'll stay on another uh, 15 minutes after the formal webinar ends. For those of you uh, who cannot stay long, we're also collecting all the questions and um, and give to the speakers to answer them afterwards. Uh, we also record the whole webinar sections. Uh, we'll share the, these uh, recordings along with the Q&A files uh, with the attendees uh, very soon. Uh, also, one more thing I want to mention is that um, I have a little kid with me. Uh, he will get uh, fussy during long hours uh, for meetings. So. Uh, so after I introduce uh, Dr. Ken Lee, um, my colleague uh, uh, Doug Mitchell will take over um, uh, the, the webinar. Okay, uh, so let's uh, get started. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Kenneth Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is the National Senior Science Advisor for Oil Spill Research Preparedness and the Response for Fisheries and Oceans Canada and science lead for the multi-phase research initiative, MPRI, under uh, Canada's Ocean Protection Plan. MPRI aims to protect collective research at the national and the 
international level between academia, government, and the private sector to advance our spill response measures and the science. Uh, science-based decision making during oil spill response operations. Uh, Dr. Lee chaired the Royal Society of Canada's expert panel on the behavior and the environmental impacts of a crude oil release into aqueous environment and has served on U.S. National Academy of Science, Engineering and committees uh, tasked to review the effects of deep, deep water horizon oil spill on ecosystem services, Arctic uh, oil spill response, and the use of uh, chemical oil dispersant. And Dr. Kan Lee also happened to be uh, my PhD supervisor. So uh, without further ado, I will turn over to Dr. Kan Lee. Thank you, Lynn. So I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to talk today about uh, some field trials that we're thinking about conducting in the near future within Canada under the multi-partner research initiative. Uh, this is a research program funded by the Canadian government under Can the Canada's Oceans Protection Plan. And it involves a number of federal agencies, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Environment Climate Change Canada, Natural Resources Canada, and the Canadian Coast Guard and Transport Canada. Oops. So I'll, I thought I'd give you a quick talk on what the multi-partner research initiative is. The goal of this research initiative is to establish an integrated global research network to advance oil spill research in Canada and to enhance Canada's level of preparedness and response capability. The idea is why are we doing all of the research ourselves within Canada when really oil spills is an international issue and we have many common issues, so let's work together. So what we want to do is advance scientific knowledge to address major gaps in oil spill response and remediation strategies that will support the development and validation of regulatory approval, what we call in Canada alternative response measures, and I'll mention those in a minute. The priorities for this research initiative were based on recommendations of the Royal Society of Canada report on the behavior and environmental impacts of crude oil released in the aqueous environments, as well as Transport Canada's uh, Tanker Safety Expert Panel report. When we looked at what we are going to focus this program on, um, under the Royal Society of Canada report, they identified over 400 research areas that we could look at, and they were cut down to seven areas, um, major areas. But when we looked at this program, we wanted to find something that was common to everything within the Canadian government and internationally that we thought was very important. And so we focused it on six areas of research to increase Canada's response toolbox. Um, these are research on spill treating agents, such as chemical oil dispersants, in situ burning, oil translocation, and decanting and oily waste disposal. Um, these first four are considered alternative response measures in Canada. They complement conventional mechanical cleanup technologies, i.e. booming and skimming, while offering a net environmental benefit. Unfortunately, in Canada, their use is held back by a number of uh, regulatory acts and policies. For instance, under the Fisheries Act, it's illegal to put deleterious substances in the marine environment. Therefore, it's difficult to use spill treating agents. So we needed science to drive forward changes in policies and regulations, as well as uh, making decisions when we do use these techniques in the future. The other thing is we all understand that we can never clean up everything in an oil spill, and it sometimes um, due to logistical constraints, we just let nature do its thing. So we also focused on natural attenuation and bioremediation. As I mentioned, the Royal Society of Canada report identified over 400 research priorities, and a lot of these items are covered under what I call cross-cutting expertise. These are areas that are common, um, areas of research that support all of the other arms technologies that we're looking at. For instance, we want to know where the oil is, oil detection. We want to know what is the toxicity of various procedures that we may use for remediation. So therefore, toxicity studies are under cross-cutting expertise. MPRI currently funds over 220 researchers at 60 institutions in 12 different countries under grants and contributions. 
Um, what I'm going to talk about today are field trials and the signing of contribution agreements for these field trials beyond year one, which is for authorization of experimental release, are still pending. Under the Royal Society of Canada report, it was identified that field trials, as well as spills of opportunity, should be an important um, aspect of moving uh, oil spill response technologies forward. There's a number of benefits um, to our federal departments and the oil spill response community in conducting field trials. One is obviously, as I mentioned, we wanna build the capability in Canada to use new alternative oil spill response technologies. The science we need to provide science-based evidence on the effectiveness and potential environmental impacts of these arms to support decision-making in oil spill response operations. We also want to collect field data to improve and validate models in oil spill response measures. So to help us in decision-making and what tools to choose. As I mentioned, there's a, a great cost savings and advances in research if we create and encourage networking between federal departments and scientists and industry, academia, and other national, international government agencies. We also want to provide an opportunity for training to the responders and the next generation of highly qualified personnel in uh, arms technology, such as in situ burn operations and the use of chemical oil dispersants. The development and technology transfer of novel technologies with commercial benefits and enhance public awareness of Canada's commitment to build and maintain a world-class oil spill response regime. In Canada right now, we actually have a legal mechanism to experimentally release oil in the environment for scientific studies under the Atlantic Accord Act. This is a legal authorization process managed by Environment Climate Change Canada. In order to have permission, you have to demonstrate contribution to scientific knowledge. And our request for the permit um, has to be supported by an environmental impact statement. There are a number of uh, gatekeepers for scientific justification. We have to provide meaningful insights in oil spill behavior, transport, freight and effects, and or countermeasure effectiveness and detrimental effects. Um, we have to show that the research that we want to conduct under field trials cannot be achieved by other means, i.e. the type of research we want to do can't be accomplished in the laboratory or mesocosm studies. And then of course, we have to clearly identify the parameters of the knowledge gaps to be addressed. And without compromising the core objective, we want to engage interested collaborators and partners to maximize the R&D opportunities and information generated. And then overall, the conduct of field studies has to show a net environmental benefit um, from the conduct of the study. So there are two field trial studies that we're looking at right now within the MPRI research program. Um, the first is the MPRI offshore burning experiment, um, which the principal investigator is called MOBI. Um, the objective is to carry out full-scale experiment on novel ISP technologies in offshore waters to bring these technologies closer to commercial read readiness and public acceptability. And of course, as I mentioned, to train the next generation of highly qualified personnel in scientific research in this area. The lead scientist for this program is Dr. Fei-Yu Wang um, at the University of Manitoba. And as you can see from the image below on this slide, it's in a collaboration and partnership with a number of uh, agencies. The last large scale field trial for in situ burning was really the NOBI experiment um, conducted by Environment Canada in 1993. And of course, we all know that in situ burning was used as a response measure um, during the Deepwater Horizon spill, where it effectively removed a large amount of the oil that was spilled. However, there are a number of gaps and concerns that remain in terms of the operational window for the use of in situ burning. We can improve burn efficiency. There are still concerns over air quality from the smoke and, and the residue on the surface. And then there's concern about 
um, marine e ecosystem impacts. Since the Novi burn and the deep water horizon, there are a number of emerging technologies that should be tested and evaluated in the field scale. So I'll describe some of the things that we're looking at um, in this proposed study. Um, one is a technology, the flame refluxer. Um, what we want to do is improve heat transfer to improve the burn efficiency. It's developed by the Worcester Technology Institute and Bessie. It improves the uh, oil's burning at a faster rate with less production of black smoke and is supported by tank scale trials that have been conducted at the U.S. Coast Guard Mobile Alabama facility and their upcoming studies at Krell and Omset on this technology. We all know that in in-situ burning, you typically use a fireproof boom, which are very heavy and expensive to use. And one of the things that we're looking at, in fact, Lin Zhao is, and Tim Nedwin are involved in this, is to look at a, another technology where we may be able to use conventional boom to get the, gather the oil into a thicker, a layer to burn and then releasing it at the apex of the boom and having the flame or the fire outside of the boom itself. Therefore, we could use conventional boom rather than fire resistant boom. This would be significantly reduce the operational cost and of course the availability of these booms is much higher. There have been tank studies in the onset on this technology and their upcoming studies in the Pope Flats to develop this technology. Um, on the meso scale. So we're looking at taking this to the field. Another novel um, in-situ burn technology is the use of remotely operated surface vehicles. Um, Tim Nedwood has talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, we're looking at a system that can be jettisoned from a ship, a helicopter, an airplane for rapid deployment. It's been developed by OSRI, um, Oil Spill Response in Institute. Um, ExxonMobil, Bessie, Shell, and other partners. It would significantly extend the window of operation for in situ burning in remote locations. So what we're looking at is a remote surface vehicle that can deliver both the herder and igniters and provide fire control if needed. Um, we're looking at testing this technology offshore at higher sea states than most people think um, that in situ burn would work. We're also testing um, ISB monitoring technologies um, in the in-situ burn study. Um, some of the things that we're looking at are improvement of the SMART protocols, which all of you in the US know, and looking at testing advances in these technologies. This includes unmanned aircraft surveillance systems for smoke sampling and monitoring technologies. And in these studies, we're also looking at remotely operated underwater vehicles, as well as autonomous underwater vehicles to look at sampling burn residue and other monitoring within the site in the scope. The tentative field plan for this study is July to August 2021. Um, we're looking at five burns and logistical support includes the Canadian Coast Guard, which will provide one or two vessels to support the release of oil and assist with cleanup. The US Coast Guard is looking at providing a cutter and it and ECRC in Canada, our Canadian RO, is also assisting with cleanup and training. The second field trial is dispersion field trials in a high energy Canadian marine environment. Um, this is a study that's led by CCOR in Memorial University in Newfoundland. And as you can see, there are numerous collaborators also. The premise of dispersing use is based in dilution of oil below toxicity threshold limits. We know that. Um, advances in dispersants have been made in the laboratory and mesoscale experiments, but these studies are often limited by the inability to capture the complexity or the scale found in the field. The agita agitation created in a lab or in a mesocosm remains artificial. Um, when we're working with a closed environment, we know we have uh, effects of the walls, limits on oil spill spreading at the surface, and oil dilution dispersion in the water column. Subsea conditions and related oil uh, behavior are quite different from the sea surface, and it's hard to perform meso experiments given the requirement on reactors, i.e., the depth of the water column. 
And one other thing, um, Chris Barker re recently noted that in a weight cap and see, oil will spend some time at the surface as a slick and some time in droplets under the surface. To properly capture the full range and fate of transport processes, this droplet slick duality must be considered. And these studies um, should be conducted in the field. One of the things that we're looking at is the surface release of oil and dispersant um, to study natural dispersion and entrainment versus effective dispersants. Obviously, we want to understand the oil droplet size and the effect of dispersants. We want to improve and calibrate predictive models to increase our understanding of oil evaporation, emulsification, spreading on oil thickness, photooxidation, dissolved oil and suspended droplet behavior, biodegradation, and MOSFA formation. The field trial component is led by Dr. Michelle Bufano um, at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, we're looking at uh, data collection and sampling and monitoring procedures have been established for monitoring dispersion efficacy analysis and biological effects and the development of predictive models, as I mentioned. We're collecting data in a number of um, criteria, as you can see in this slide. We're also looking at potentially um, releasing subsurface uh, release of oil. And here we're looking at um, using ROVs and AUVs to track the plume. We're looking at approximately 2,000 liters of oil released for each test. And not only releasing oil, but releasing oil with gas to look at things like churn flow. And of course, looking at a DOR with the dispersants. For both of these field trials, we're now undergoing a, a, a exercise in site selection which involves significant consultation with government regulators, the public, indigenous groups, fisheries groups, and NGOs. And the final decision will be based on logistical considerations um, and the review of supporting environmental impact assessment. Some of the data that we're looking at in these studies, as I mentioned, AUV, ROV, subsurface data collection. We want to study early mass transfer of saturates, aromatics, resins, and acetylene fractions um, to understand the processes such as evaporation, dissolution, and photooxidation with dispersant usage. This is led by Dr. Helen Zane at Memorial University. Um, Uta Paslo at Ocean Science in Memorial University will study oil particle interactions. And so we're looking at um, field evidence we know um, that MOSFA formed in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is substantiated by models. What we want to do are conduct these studies in the field, and there's now a need for experiments with natural particle populations and oil dispersants. The oil dispersant study will also include a large um, contingent looking at the SMART protocol in the implementation in tandem with other remote sensing and ROV technology. The science leads for this are Robin Comey with EPA, um, Lisa DePinto with NOAA, and Dana Tulis with the US Coast Guard, who's looking at providing us with a, a Coast Guard cutter in support of our research. So that's my presentation. I'll be glad to uh, take any questions. Thanks, Ken. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. We do have a question. It's from Sam Airy who works at Exxon. Uh, do the planned field trial experiments include extensive sampling and measurements of speciation quantified hydrocarbons and collected samples from the sea surface and the water column? He says experience has shown that this can provide an excellent basis to constrain weathering processes and mass balances in the field. <laughs> Definitely, that is something that we're looking at. And as I mentioned, we're working on the uh, sampling protocols and Dr. Helen Zhang is coordinating a large effort, as I mentioned, to look at the various hydrocarbon components in the oil, both on the surface, the water column, and we'll even go back and look at sediments as, as required. Um, we would have to do that for our monitoring program anyway, but no, we're looking at detailed chemical analysis in these studies to advance the science. Okay, and then there's an additional question. Uh, has an invitation to participate in some of these studies been extended to other academics beyond those stated on your slide? 
Uh, obviously, as, as I noted, the MPRI research program, we're looking at trying to set up a network. Um, right now, we have only funded year one of the study to uh, make sure that we can get the permit to conduct the study. And once that's done, we're looking at obviously approving the contribution agreements for the rest of the study. Um, by all means, one of the ideas of this field work, as I mentioned in the start, was to provide an opportunity or a forum for other people to join in. I'm not sure um, how much funding would be available for this, but we would be open to people coming within kind of support to enhance the scope of the study by all means. Okay, let me see. And question is, is the subsurface release experiment going to be at the same time as the ISB trials? Um, no, these are separate studies. Um, but they're going to be conducted uh, hopefully back to back because of ship time. Um, obviously, we can't put everything on board ship for one study. So we'll be coming in um, between experiments. Uh-oh. Uh the type of boom for ISP and, and the canal for re releasing the oil um, for the oil dispersion studies. So um, no, they're not conducted at the same time, but they are conducted um, continuously in back-to-back -back manner is the plan. Okay. Let's see, and there's one from Allison Chua. She said, sorry, Ken, I pre prematurely sent my question. I was wondering about the timing to ask if participants in the first could also participate in the second. So I guess if you participate in the in situ burn, can you also participate in the subsea release as well? I guess that's what she's asking. By all means, um, like I said, we're looking at enhancing the scope of the studies. Um, the way I look at field trials is there are very few opportunities to conduct field trials, and we all optimize the science that we get all of it. So as long as people aren't interfering with the core um, program, and they can add science on top of it to improve the scope of the study, by all means, if we can get people on board ship and accommodate them, um, we're open up, open to having other people join in the project. Perfect. Yeah, I, my 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 background prior to working for Exxon is in oceanography, so I perfectly understand maximizing what you can get out of ship time because it's so expensive. Exactly, and of course, we've got another problem right now with COVID nineteen. Um, we can't have people double up in cabins. So we're actually looking at not uh, hoteling people on shore and actually bringing people um, to the field site every day also. And i got time for one last one, I think, before we move on to the next. I was asking, you listed a type of gas and hydrocarbons that can be detected with the AUV. Can it detect hydrogen sulfide? I'm not sure. Um, essentially, the Explorer AUV can take any sensor that you want to plug into the system um, as you see in the photograph, it's a rather large AUV. So um, if there's a sensor made for H2S and if there was a reason for it, I'm sure we could plug it in. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for answering the questions. You can unshare your screen. <laughs> we can move on to the next presenter. So the next presenter is Melissa Partika. So Missy, if you're listening, <laughs> I figured you are. <laughs> Hello. You can uh, go ahead and unmute and share your screen. So uh, the bio for her, she's based in Mobile, Alabama with the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium and the Gulf Sea Grant Oil Spill Science Outreach Team. Missy uses her background in coastal ecology and epidemiology to work closely with the public to explore and explain complex environmental issues, particularly those relating to human health and the environment. And without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much for having me today and thank you all for joining. As you said, I'm Missy Partika. I'm with Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. I'm a member of the Oil Spill Science Outreach Team and today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my team's efforts to share the signs of oil spills, use of dispersants, and how we work with the response community to work out, um, reach out to our stakeholders. 
To begin with, for those of you that aren't familiar with my team or some of the programs in the Gulf of Mexico, I am partially funded through the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Um, GOMRI, as it's called, was founded shortly after Deepwater Horizon in 2010 with $500 million in non-penalty funds from BP dedicated to researching the impacts of the oil spills. GOMRI is an independent research program that is administered by the Gulf of Mexico Alliance and led by an independent 20-member research board with representation in all five Gulf states. While the initial research efforts of GOMRI really focused on the immediate aftermath of the spill, Subsequent research has turned towards longer term modeling, focusing on recovery, looking at prevention of future oil spills and building partnerships across institutions. Gomery is in its 10th and final year, but that doesn't mean everything is done. Um, efforts recently have turned towards synthesizing the enormous volumes of research that have been collected over the past 10 years. My team and I are helping to consolidate some of that information so you can look forward to some outreach documents that will come from those efforts as well. However, early on, it wasn't clear how the public was going to gain access to all of the rich information that was being collected by the researchers and all of the science that they might need in order to make decisions. So to that end, in 2014, GOMRI expanded its programmatic reach by partnering with the Sea Grant programs who've been serving coastal communities for over 50 years. For those of you who aren't familiar with Sea Grant, we are a part of NOAA, Oce National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Um, and much like land grant institutions, Sea Grant programs are university based throughout the United States, every single state that has a coast, including all the Great Lakes. And as we say about Lake Champlain, one pretty good one. We receive both federal and state funds with an emphasis on research education and extension. We are a science-based program and we practice non-advocacy. Essentially what that means is we do not use our relationships with stakeholders to promote any particular viewpoint, rather serve as neutral brokers of peer-reviewed science and government reporting. As I said, I am one of a member of a team. I'm based in Mobile, Alabama with Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant, but I also have a uh, team members throughout the entire Gulf. Monica Wilson is with Florida Sea Grant in St. Petersburg, Florida. Emily Mon Douglas is with Louisiana Sea Grant in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And Danny Bailey, our newest team member, is in Corpus Christi with Texas Sea Grant. But those are just the extension agents on our team. We also have Tara Skelton, our team communicator, and Steve Sempier, our team's manager, both of which are with Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. As a team, we focus on interacting with specific target audiences that rely on a healthy golf to work, live, and play. These stakeholder groups can roughly divided, be divided into those that require information for technical on-job uh, decision-making and those that require a clean and healthy golf but are frequently left out of the loop and the flow of information. So you can see those groups here that we specifically focus on. So how do we do that? Um, I'm going to be going into these different little sections here in, in greater detail, but essentially it begins with two-way engagement. We can't answer questions of our stakeholders if we don't know what those questions are. So we go out to our communities, we go to our different stakeholder groups, we talk to industry leaders from those different icons that I just showed on the previous slide, and we ask them questions. We ask them what they're concerned about. You know, we, we spend time communicating with them to understand what is it that they need to know in order to make decisions or to feel safe when they are enjoying the out of doors. Um, so we collect their input and we get their questions. And from there, we consolidate that information and we look to see what the available literature is able to tell us. We look in peer reviewed journals, we look in government reports, and we comb through all of that in order to find the answers to their questions. But while we're able to sometimes just turn around and send an email with a very direct response to a question, sometimes it requires a little bit more synthesizing and assimilation. So we create outreach documents and we hold seminars and we put together workshops. Um, we create videos. We find different ways to actually answer our stakeholders' questions in a way that is meaningful to them. And then we do it all over again. So it doesn't stop there. We go back again and sometimes we redo things as new information becomes apparent and we have to update our available uh, resources. 
After six years, we've created over 30 outreach bulletins and fact sheets. Many of them have been translated into additional languages. We've hosted over 60 seminars. We've had an entire uh, webinar series this summer since we're all virtual now. All of this content, along with the recordings of all of our webinars, along with animated videos, additional resources, and even scientific communication tips for those that are trying to figure out how to communicate better with their audiences, all of that is hosted on our website. So if you're not familiar, I recommend you go and check it out. Or if you are familiar, go ahead and check back and see if we've got some updated materials on there. As I said, we've been doing webinars all summer long and so have uh, created a lot of additional content. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll go through some of the specifics that we've been doing um, specifically related to stakeholder engagement on the topic of dispersants. So I'll be talking about how we do that input um, solicitation, how we go about consolidating things and what some of those products are that we've created. To begin with, right when the team started in 2014, there was an obvious need to figure out what the community members' needs were, what those questions were. And so they set about holding um, a series of small group and individual meetings. Over the course of about a year and a half, there were 106 of these meetings total. Dispersants were mentioned in 66 of those meetings. Of those 66 meetings where dispersants were specifically mentioned, there were 75 specific mentions of different dispersant subtopics. And that might be something like, what are impacts to human health? Or how does this impact the environment? What does this mean for fisheries? So you can see some of those questions that were specifically asked of our stakeholders right here. Things that could be as broad as, you know, how toxic are they really? Or um, something that came up in a recent webinar is why do so many residents think they were exposed to dispersants and what can be done to dispel those misconceptions? And these are things that even years later, we are still challenged with in the Gulf of Mexico. And my team works actively to try to answer those questions. So one of the ways, like I said, we go about answering those questions is to jump right into the literature. We look at, what the questions are, see if we can formulate a, a cohesive set of, of answers to those, and come up with themed documents. We have multi-page bulletins like those ones that you see right here that allows us to translate science to non-scientists in a way that's digestible and understandable, frequently with charts and figures and images to convey that information. Um, our series on dispersants, the four that you see right here, cover not only the role of dispersants and surfactants in response, but their persistence in the environment, their interactions with aquatic organisms, and how they might be used in the future. Though these full-length publications are fairly simplified and boiled down um, of the, the detailed science, some of our stakeholders uh, have requested even shorter versions. And that's where our one pagers come in. So what you see right here is a, a, a one page document. It is front and back. So I guess technically it's two pages. Um, but we cover the top questions that are asked about dispersants and answer them in a very succinct way about a paragraph a piece. Specifically in this document, we ask, uh, answer the questions of what are dispersants? When and where are they used? What are the impacts to sea life? What are the existing policies surrounding their use? And how are they, were they applied following Deepwater Horizon? Like I said, these continue to be questions that are asked. Um, and more importantly, there are questions that we continue to answer and update as necessary, including, can you please make translations of this? So that short one page document has been translated into Vietnamese at a specific request from members of the Vietnamese fishing community. As I said, we have a number of documents that have been translated to additional languages and can you continue to do so mainly on a per request basis. So if you have seen any of our documents and you think that they should be translated or if you have a need to have them translated, um, please contact me. But not everyone wants to read through documents or download a PDF, or maybe they have specific questions that we were, weren't able to address um, during one of these outreach publics or publications. Um, 
so they might just want to hear it right from the proverbial horse's mouth. And that's why over the years, we've hosted a series of webinars and workshops where we bring in members of the response community, we bring in researchers working on these topics like Dr. Lee, um, where they can actually share their science and then be available to answer some questions directly. Uh, all of them are a little bit different. All of them are virtual right now, just like this onset webinar series that we're all participating in. We all follow a, a general format where we have a series of speakers and then the audience is allowed to engage with them and ask their questions. And I'm simply there, or my team members are simply there to help facilitate that discussion. And as part of that feedback loop that we talked about too, is that after these webinars, um, we receive additional input from our audience members. So it's during these Q&A sessions where they're just asking specific questions that we might get additional um, ideas for future seminars, future outreach publications. Um, sometimes these questions that they're asking here are outside of the scope of the speakers that we've invited. When this happens, we turn around and specifically seek out additional expertise or additional research to help find those answers and then we re-engage with our audiences that we're participating. We feel it's following up with our participants to answer their questions in the most straightforward and um, understandable way possible that allows us to continue our reputation as trusted brokers of science. While we answer the questions of a wide variety of different stakeholder groups, we also work very closely with members of the response community to not only answer their questions, but also foster relationships with the community members. Um, recently, We've produced a summary report for a series of workshops aimed at fostering greater collaboration between responders and researchers. These workshops took place over a, a number of years meant to specifically um, increase this conversation between the response community and researchers so that responders were aware of current research and that researchers were aware of different response protocols and they could figure out where there might be gaps in understanding or knowledge in order for research to begin to fill it in or for response to start maybe modifying some of their contingency plans to incorporate some of the most up-to-date research. Um, over the years, we've engaged with the response community in a number of different ways beyond just this workshop series. For instance, my team members and I, we all attend area committee meetings where we present about our team, some of the latest findings on oil spill science and engage in those discussions about their planning and contingency plans, as well as increasing uh, transparency with our communities, where then we go back and talk to them about what we've learned at AC meetings. We've also participated in tabletop, tabletop exercises and spill drills, where we've been able to be brought in as active um, members of these drills, so that we have a better understanding of the moving parts that are there, how we might be able to um, feed into the response strategies, particularly on the side of communication. And to that end, it became apparent that some of the response groups might act a liaison specific to some of these different impacted communities. So Emily, member of our team, worked closely with C Consulting, helping to write the appendices to the original response team six contingency plan, actually creating a fisheries liaison position within Sea Grant to work closely with the response community in the event of an oil spill. Specifically, the topic of herders and uh, surface collecting agents came up during an oil spill preparedness exercise that Emily participated in back in May of 2019. And there the responders indicated that they really wanted to have more information about the use of those types of alternative strategies. What it followed was a series of discussions between Sea Grant and NOAA and the Coast Guard to understand the use of SEAs and herders. And then in mid-March, just this past March, um, Emily hosted a seminar on the use of chemical herders and SEAs in conjunction with Sector New Orleans during the Southeastern Louisiana Area Committee meeting. Tim Nedwood got to participate in that. Uh, this seminar allowed responders to hear directly from consultants and researchers about the available emerging research and the use of herders during response. 
This was the last meeting held by her team at a, a live event. Um, you can see by the date right here on March 12th, um, we had hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes out and we were all a little bit concerned because the room was pretty packed and it was at a public library where there was an AARP uh, tax seminar going on. So being right outside New Orleans, it probably was um, a good thing that it was one of the last events that we had. So we have transitioned to 100% online at this point, but we are looking forward to beginning holding some in-person meetings, um, hopefully in 2021. So as much as it's our mission to share science with our uh, stakeholder groups and audience members, it's also vital that we as a team continue to learn and grow our understanding of these important topics, um, especially since the science is evolving as we've already heard from, from Dr. Lee. Uh, one of the ways that we've learned more about the use of dispersants during uh, response and the available science on it is that we've had the opportunity to actually travel to New Jersey back when we could still travel and attend onset. So you can see my, my team members and I over the course of a, a couple different years actually presented at the onset workshop at that facility. We even got to see a demonstration of that flaming tongue technique uh, that Tim is very proud of and Dr. Lee presented on briefly. But it's through these uh, different opportunities that we continue to make connections with different researchers in the field that help improve our ability to share the science of oil spills and the use of dispersants with our audience members, bringing in some of those scientists that maybe we haven't interacted with in the past. So um, I think I have plenty of time on here if there is anybody that has any questions about our work that we do, how we interact with the public, or um, the ways that we go about engaging the stakeholders. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Missy. That was an excellent presentation. Very interesting. I find it, it's very nice that somebody's out there whose purpose is to kind of fit that gap between the different stakeholders within there because they all have different perspectives and different thoughts and you guys have a chance to get in there to really get a chance to fathom what each side is thinking and kind of get a feel and understanding and then bridge the gap and help them communicate better which is often a missing component that's specific, specifically why my team was created is even though gomri all the different consortia within gomri had different uh, outreach teams and components uh, what was clear is that after a number of years, uh, there was information being collected, but it wasn't making its way back again to different stakeholder groups, whether it was members of the fishing industry or tourism or response community, that they weren't necessarily getting that updated information. And we're all scientists on this team. As you heard in my introduction, my background is in yeah. coastal ecology, but Monica that's in Florida is, has an oceanography background, Emily is a, an aquatic toxicologist. Uh, Danny has worked extensively with the fishing industry. So we were able to bring our experience and knowledge to bear on this too. Yep, that's pretty neat. All right, questions, folks. <laughs> Not yet. I think maybe you were so clear. I just did such an excellent job. <laughs> You're so crystal clear. <laughs> oh, one has popped up. Let me scroll down and find it. No, they don't come in in order. <laughs> that would be easy. Yeah, it would. Okay, let me see. So this is from Rob Holland. The latest tip sheet for academic researchers is a great contribution. Do you have a plan for future oil spill science publications for 2021? So that's a great question. Um, as those of you that are familiar with, with Gomri uh, know that this is the 10th year. And so Gomri is sunsetting and we're focusing on synthesis activities. All of our team members are working very closely with those synthesis teams. There's a total of eight core areas that are working on different um, synthesis publications. And so we'll be turning those into outreach publications. However, it's apparent that the need for this information to continue to feed out into the community is not going to magically dissipate on December 31st of 2020. And so we are working with Gomri right now to look at ways to extend the reach of our team into 2021 and beyond so that we can continue to share oil spill science. We're likely to do some more publications. We're likely to continue to host 
seminars. We're also looking for different ways that we might continue to engage with our audience members and extend the reach of this research. Cool. All right, and so let me see, we have a, another question. So what are Sea Grant's plans to expand this program to the West Coast? So it's interesting that you say that. So um, in 2018 through 2019, we actually were partially funded by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, the Gulf Research Program specifically, to understand what were regionally important needs for oil spill response and community uh, resilience. And so we hosted a series of workshops uh, throughout the U.S. in different areas in order to engage with the local Sea Grant programs and talk uh, to the local community members to figure out what their needs were. And one of them was held uh, in Southern California in Santa Barbara. And so we engaged the Western Seaboard of the contiguous U.S. with that one and worked with the Sea Grant programs out there. I don't know that they're planning on creating any type of team, but we do liaise with them regularly. And in fact, uh, my team, we, we regularly talk to uh, the regional Sea Grant program. So I'm the representative of my team to the, the Gulf Lake, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The Great Lakes uh, Sea Grant programs. And they have a, a group there, the, the Crude Moves Oil Spill Group that engage with each other uh, regularly and host seminars. And so I interact with them. We also have team members that are working with the Eastern Seaboard, the Western Seaboard, up in Alaska, and in the Caribbean, in order to, if they don't want to create their own programs, at least foster this relationship and give them the resources they need to engage with their stakeholders. Okay. So let me see, we have a question from Darcy Bird from Washington Ecology. So you mentioned that certain groups believe they were exposed to dispersants during the Gulf response. Do you know why this occurred? And there was a follow-up. How do we communicate more effectively in the future to our communities in the event of a spill about dispersant use and exposure risks? You know, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, something that comes up regularly in some of our, our seminars and workshops is that it's not as simple as uh, dispelling somebody's firmly held belief with concrete facts. Um, because if somebody believes something, you can't just show them a different set of facts to show that they're, that's not true. And so to increase the trust and make sure that people feel like they're being heard, um, we don't just come right out necessarily and tell them that they're mistaken. Uh, we do show them the information that the use of dispersants was very well tracked and that there is no indication that there was any incidental spraying of dispersants within three miles of any coastal community or fishing vessel. Um, however, there was also a lot of uh, pest uh, spraying that was going on during that time, whether it was from um, crop dusters or uh, mosquito attenuation programs. And so there was spraying that was going on in some of our coastal marsh environments during the time of the oil spill. And so a number of our community members did see these low flying planes spraying something in the vicinity of their communities and they equated that with dispersion application. Um, we've continued to speak to them about it. We've continued to share with them that there's no records of physical uh, contact of our community members with these chemicals, um, but it's really ongoing and it's a sensitive subject. And anytime you're speaking to community members about their health and the health of their family and their children, um, we tread very carefully. We do continue to engage. And we do continue to uh, share the best available information about their use. Okay. Hmm. I think that is it. There is one other, uh, somebody asked about the Caspian Sea, but I think that's Sea Grant's US base, right? <laughs> we are mostly US based. Um, we do have representation in uh, the South Pacific. Um, but as far as I know, we don't have any representation over in that direction. That doesn't mean that we don't partner with different international organizations or when there are international spills, we frequently get contacted because our website has become fairly visible. Okay. 
And we have one last uh, comment. And this is uh, from somebody we all know, from Tom Colbaugh. We hope to see people at the Amish hey, facility in the not too distant future. <laughs> Little sales plug there for Omset and Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So, I like your picture of the burning tongue. So somewhere in the background there, me and Lynn Zhao are running around because me and her were running all those tests on set while you guys were there. <laughs> I'm sure. It was very impressive, and the whole entire uh, facility is very cool. It is. It's a great place to go do oil spill response work. So big plug there for you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Missy. That was a great talk. Appreciate it. And so if you go ahead and unshare, and then we can uh, move on to the next presentation. So next up, we have uh, Susan and Kelly. Susan, I believe, is going first. So a little about uh, Susan. Susan Roberts is the director of the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. She joined the staff of the Ocean Studies Board as a program officer in 1998 and became the director in 2004. She received her PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where she studied marine microbiology and fish physiology and biochemistry. Prior to the Ocean Studies Board, she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley and as a senior staff fellow at the National Institutes of Health, conducting research in cell and de developmental biology. She is an AAAS fellow and a member of the editorial panel for the first and second editions of the Global Ocean Science Report published by IOC UNESCO. Uh, and also going to be speaking during this presentation will be Kelly Oskvig. Uh, she is a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and serves as the study director for the Oil in the Sea, Volume 4. Previously, she worked at the Academy's Gulf Research Program, where she served as the lead on the Safer Offshore Energy Systems Initiative, including directing the study, understanding, and predicting the Gulf of Mexico loop current, critical gaps, and recommendations. Prior to her positions at the National Academy, she was involved in geotechnical investigations in the Gulf, environmental monitoring in the Gulf, and program management for the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. She earned her MS in Physical Oceanography at Texas A&M and her BS in Civil Engineering at the University of Texas. And with that, I will pass it over to Susan. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to give you this very brief rundown on a very long report called Use of Dispersants in Marine Oil Spill Response. And um, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of a couple of chapters in the report. And this was at the recommendation of Tim Nedwin, who suggested that we focus a little bit on the fates and effects and then the aquatic toxicology. So I'm not going to talk about the whole report, just a couple of chapters. But first, I wanted to mention that um, this is not the first report that the National Academies has produced on dispersants. The first one was in 1989. And then we had another report that came out in 2005. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that the, the most recent report that was published this year builds upon these previous reports. So we tried not to you know, just um, regurgitate some of the information that is still relevant from these reports, but to really build on a lot of the work that came out after um, the Deepwater Horizon. So the 2020 report that I'm gonna be discussing today is not, um, it, it, it's not a retrospective analysis of the Deepwater Horizon, but we recognize that a lot of the research that was done was based on that particular spill. So there is you know, kind of a heavy emphasis, but it's, it's certainly not just on the Deepwater Horizon. And then the other thing I was gonna mention is that we have done other reports on oil spill response and oil in the C3, which is over on the left side is, is up for a refresh now, and that's what Kelly is going to talk to you about when I'm finished with this presentation. But we've also done some other um, studies, including one that was focused on the Deepwater Horizon and ecosystem services approach to assessing the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon spill on the Gulf of Mexico, and that was done shortly after the spill. It was a congressionally mandated study. 
Uh, we also did a report, a very short report for um, Bessie that was looking at the effective daily recovery capacity. So looking at skimmer capacity and how that's um, assessed. And then uh, also one looking at responding to oil spills in the Arctic and recognizing some of the unique challenges for doing oil spill response in that environment. So for Academy's report, it's really the first step in developing a study is to decide on what we call our statement of task. And the statement of task for this particular report was actually quite long and detailed. Um, so that's why it wouldn't fit on, on a slide. So I just am presenting this one paragraph, but I think it does capture the essence of the issue. And that is really trying to evaluate the trade-offs that are associated with dispersant use. And so um, one of the things I wanted to mention is um, I'm not going to talk about net environmental benefit analysis, which is discussed quite a bit in the, in the report. But to emphasize that really the point of this is to try to make good decisions in terms of you know, both planning for oil spill response, but also in the event of a spill, what, what response technologies are you going to employ and how do you make some of these difficult decisions. And the net environmental benefit analysis approaches are one way to do that. And looking at those, um, some of those approaches, you can start to identify particular questions that need to be addressed um, with further research. So the, ta the particular tasks in this study are, you can map pretty closely to the chapters in the report. So that's the fate and transport, the aquatic toxicology and biological effects, we also included human health considerations, and I just want to mention that that was not something that had been included in the previous studies in 1989 and 2005. And then, as I just mentioned, the tools for decision making, which really talks a lot about different approaches for um, net, environment, net environmental benefit analysis, or NEVA. Um, comparing response options. So one of the things that comes in common to a lot of our reports is saying, you know, we need all the tools in the toolkit for oil spill response. And so you need to, you know, sort of look at what response options are available and are appropriate for the particular circumstances of the spill. And then also, you know, what are our research needs and decision making protocols. One of the things that the report does talk about is, you know, sort of what um, <clears throat> In terms of research protocols also, you know, what, what approaches do we need? And I'm going to you know, sort of thank Ken Lee because he brought up the one about you know, being able to do more um, field scale uh, studies. And that was really one of the major recommendations from this report. So I want to give a shout out to our committee. And it was quite a large group with a lot of different areas of expertise. I wanted to particularly note Mary Landry, who is the chair of the committee, and also the study director, Stacy Karras. So as most of you know who've worked on Academy's reports, our study directors carry a heavy load, uh, and, and Stacy certainly did a, a huge amount of work on this report, and so I want to give her a shout out, as well as the chair for, for the leadership. But I think many of you will recognize a lot of the names on this list. Um, we had a lot of different types of expertise to match the task for the study. So I'm going to go through a few of the, you know, sort of major um, findings and a couple of recommendations that came out of the report on these first two chapters on um, fate and, uh, and transport and the aquatic toxicology. So I'm going to talk actually quite a bit about, you know, sort of what I would call some of the chemistry of this issue. And that is because I think sometimes people in particularly, you know, in thinking about the outreach work that Sea Grant does, um, how important it is to talk to people about how disparents are a mixture of components. It's not a single compound, but it's a mixture of solvents and surfactants. And so these different components are going to have different physical chemical properties and that's going to have an impact on their fate in the environment. So um, the other thing is that uh, studies have shown that the dispersant components generally are subject to rapid dilution, dissolution and degradation um, to different extents, um, and depending on the environment that they're used in. And that's particularly became evident in the Deepwater Horizon 
where it appeared that the DOS, which is one of the components of the dispersants, um, was more persistent at depth than it had been previously seen at the surface, but it also um, <clears throat> diluted quite rapidly. So this is a quite busy <laughs> cartoon of um, fate and transport, but it's trying to capture both the deep water release and also the surface. So one of the things that the report makes, you know, uh, the point of is that we have many more surface spills than we do deep water spills, so we need to be cognizant of the use of dispersants for both circumstances. And um, so the major uh, take home messages is are the faint and transport of the oil depends on the location of the source, the type of oil, the composition of the oil, and then the environmental conditions. And then the actions of dispersants um, depends on the type of oil, the degree of weathering, and the mixing energy at the site of the application. So as I mentioned, I'm going to sort of focus a bit on the chemistry. And one of the ways that I can think, I think about the deep water release is really where the water column is serving as a separation medium for this very complex mixture that we describe, you know, that we characterize as oil. <clears throat> so what you're looking at here is from, a, it's a paper from Ryerson et al. in 2012. And <clears throat> as you see the oil <clears throat> rising from um, the sea floor up to the surface, the composition changes. So in C, <clears throat> you're looking at um, the oil in the, in the deep plume, and that's those red bars. But the oil at the surface, the composition has changed quite a bit because the dissolved components have been released. And then also at the surface, you have the evaporation of the volatile mixtures that are detected in the atmosphere. So <clears throat> what, what regulates this is really the depth of the water columns. And depth is really important because that's in a sense the length of your fractionation and also the size of the droplets, because that determines on how fast the oil goes from the, um, the sea floor to the surface. And that's a critical component, which is on the next, uh, yeah, on the next slide. So this um, figure shows the relationship between um, the time it takes for a droplet to rise to the surface and the diameter of the droplet it is a log-log curve there, so, but you can see it's a pretty uh, dramatic dependence on size. And then the three different curves there are showing different oil density. So the density also has an impact on the rise time of the droplets. But uh, as I think most of us who've been going to at least the Gomery conferences lately have heard a lot about droplet size. And uh, one of my friends who's a biologist said, I don't understand why there's all this discussion about droplets at, at the conference. But and I said, oh, yeah, droplets are really important. <laughs> so you can't really um, emphasize how much, you know, how important that is in terms of really understanding the fates and effects of oil, both with, with and without dispersants. And then one of the things um, that the report also talks about is how important experimental systems and models are to really start to understand droplet formation and distribution. And though there's been a lot of work on this area, but we still have more to do to really understand um, <coughs> phenomena such as tip streaming, the pressure gradients and outgassing at the, at the well. So one of the recommendations from the report is that we really need to have more observations of droplet formation and as close to field scale as possible. Another recommendation was that we um, conduct a model hindcast of uh, the uh, VOCs that were generated around the Makanda well. And this is to really help us better validate models and understand some of the processes affecting the VOC concentrations. And VOCs are really important in terms of oil spill response, um, particularly if you're thinking about the VOCs at the, at the side of the schwanz over the well and being able to conduct the work safely, both in terms of the health of the responders and also you know, potential for fire. <clears throat> Let's see. Here's the next slide. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the aquatic toxicity and the biological impacts. And one of the reasons why I really emphasize that, you know, how the oil changes as it moves through the water column is that that affects the composition of the oil. And it's the composition of the oil that's really important for the toxicity. But a lot of um, concern at the time of the Deepwater Horizon was with the toxicity of the dispersants themselves. And that's what this figure is showing. It's a comparison of the toxicity of uh, different um, dispersant formulations. It's looking at the acute HC5. So these are the, five, the fifth percentile, the most sensitive species. And the take home message from this is there's not a huge difference in the, in the toxicity of the different dispersant components. And as in previous reports um, that the academies has produced on this topic, the primary concern is whether the dispersed oil is more toxic than the untreated oil, not the toxicity of the modern dispersant formulations. So one of the issues that comes up over and over again, um, this was brought up in the 2005 report and again in um, the 2020 report, is how do we conduct these toxicity tests? So we know that we can't really recreate field conditions in a laboratory. That's not really pragmatic. Um, so we have to basically do these toxicity studies that can give us sort of an indication of um, how, <coughs> how organisms are gonna respond to the um, oil in the environment. A lot of, um, but oil is a very complex mixture. It's, it's only partially dissolved in, in, in the seawater. And so doing these tests is not as simple as perhaps, you know, some other types of toxicity tests that have been conducted because of this complex interaction of the oil and the water. <clears throat> and, one of the, and it becomes even more complex when you add in dispersants. So one of the questions that has come up is adding dispersants, does it make um, the solution more toxic than without dispersants? But it turns out it's not that easy a question to answer. Um, the, the committee recommended um, that one of the, that the, <clears throat> that the experimental approach that should be used to answer that particular question of whether the oil plus dispersants is more toxic than the oil alone is to use an, a variable loading approach. And the reason for this is that <clears throat> with a, when you mix uh, oil and dispersants and seawater, you generate quite a lot of droplets in the solution. And if you're working with a, a solution at equilibrium, which is the, the goal for most of these preparations, then as you dilute that um, preparation with the droplets, the droplets will establish a new equilibrium in the diluted solution. So you cannot take um, the dilution factor as an indication of the actual concentration of the um, dissolved components. You would have to actually kind of, you'd have to measure um, those components directly to know what the concentration is. Um, and that has a big impact because with the dispersants, you have a lot more droplets than you would with um, the oil in water alone in the, in the water accommodated fraction. So that concentration is going to change more dramatically with the dispersants than it will with a um, solution without dispersants. With variable loading, that's not an issue because you're changing the amount of oil that's added initially. You're not diluting it after the fact. So you don't have a re-establishment of that equilibrium. So um, <clears throat> the recommendations are that Funding organizations should require a standardized toxicity testing methods and analytical protocols. And that for testing the effect of dispersants, variable loading is recommended. The other one is that passive dosing shows some promise for media preparation without micro droplets. And that helps in terms of toxicity testing of the dissolved components only. Which doesn't mean that droplets are not you know, a concern, just that if you want to ask the question about the dissolved components, it helps not to have the micro droplets present. So the committee did a meta-analysis of uh, the studies that did use variable loading to do the comparison of the water accommodated fractions um, with and without dispersant to ask that question of whether 
the dispersant made the oil more toxic. And this figure shows that below 100 milligrams of oil per liter, there wasn't a change in the toxicity of the water common day diffraction compared <coughs> for oil compared to oil with dispersants. At higher concentrations, it did look like there was more toxicity from the um, chemically enhanced uh, dispersant treated WAF. <clears throat> and it's possible that part of that toxicity is coming from um, the droplets. So um, this is the summary that dispersants have been implicated in the formation of uh, MOSFA, so, uh, which may have toxicological impacts on near-field benthos, so the MOSFA sediments and that, that transports some of the oil to the seafloor. Um, despite the potential reduction in VOCs, the hazard posed by dispersant use to wildlife under field conditions is not fully understood. So we don't completely understand um, the impacts of chemically versus physically dispersed oil. And the effects of dispersants are studied in static laboratory exposures, and we know that the um, <clears throat> field conditions are quite different from that. Inhalation of VOCs or inhalation aspiration of oil drops by cetaceans and birds and fouling presents hazards to other surface dwelling organisms, and dispersion of surface slicks can reduce the risk of exposure to these species. And with that, I'd like to do a call out to our sponsors, the Gulf Research Program, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, Environmental Protection Agency, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, American Petroleum Institute, and Clean Caribbean and Americas. I'd also like to thank the reviewers of the report, the invited speakers, participants, and other contributors, and also our consultants, Scott Slikolowski and Jonas Gross, who produced some uh, additional modeling exercises for the fate and effects for this for this study. And with that, I can take questions or we can move on to Kelly's presentation. Well, I'd say let's move on to Kelly and then we'll take questions for both of you guys after. Okay. That way she has enough time to at least get hers in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you're on. <laughs> okay, all right, hi. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for the invitation to join you all this morning um, and tell you a bit about this new study that we have underway, Oil in the C4. Um, so this is uh, a pretty literal update um, to Oil in the C3. Uh, sorry, my uh, screen is a little funny. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a 24-month study. Um, it was officially started in April of 2020. Um, the report will be released in, uh, to the public in early of 20, 2022. Um, Oil in the C3 was released in 2003 on work that started in 1999. Um, and clearly, there is a need to, to update that study. Um, the sponsors that we have on, on board are the American Petroleum Institute, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, and the Gulf of Mexico Research Alliance, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the National Academies President's Fund. So we've got six sponsors. Um, we actually heard from them all last week um, in our first public session. Um, and let me kind of tell you a little bit more about statement of task and kind of what's coming um, on, our, on our timeline and what to expect. Um, so the, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the statement of task is um, divided, divided into two parts right here just to show you, but it's one committee covering um, input space and effects. Um, in terms of inputs, we're looking to examine natural and anthropogenic sources of hydrocarbons entering the marine environment. We want to develop and summarize quantitative estimates of hydrocarbons in the marine environment. Um, we want to review progress in implementing the recommendations um, from the last report and identify recommendations that we still need to, to address. Um, we want to provide recommendations um, for the future to improve our estimates of inputs and identify focus areas for reducing those inputs from human activities. 
And for fates and effects, um, we're looking to assess and discuss physical and chemical characteristics and behaviors of the hydrocarbons. And when I say hyd hydrocarbons, um, we're talking fossil fuel hydrocarbons. Um, I know there's a lot of different terminologies um, thrown in here. Um, and then we're looking at the uh, transport and fate of the mixtures in the marine environment and the effects of those mixtures on the marine environment. Um, we also want to characterize the risk posed to the marine environment by fossil fuel hydrocarbons um, or type of input, um, given the range of organisms and ecosystems like to be affected. One thing I failed to mention earlier is that we're looking at North American waters. So there's a lot of different environments um, that are um, included in those North American waters. Um, as with inputs, we're also looking to review progress in implementing the recommendations from the last report um, and identifying uh, recommendations that we still need to address and then providing uh, new recommendations to improve our understanding of the fates and effects of hydrocarbons. Um, so this is kind of the general timeline. The project kicked off in April. Uh, we had our call for committee nominations. Uh, we put together our committee. Um, and then we're right now in this kind of month five to 20, um, holding our committee meetings. So we're actually funded to hold six in-person meetings. Um, clearly that looks different now. Um, and we'll likely have more meetings, but shorter meetings. So uh, the committee is in discussion right now how, how to uh, work that out to address all the, um, the needs that we have for information gathering. So of these meetings, there are um, closed sessions of just the committee, and then there's open sessions where we bring in experts um, to help us address uh, the different pieces of the statement of task. So um, let's see, on the 18th, we brought in uh, a this, our sponsors and we heard um, what they would like out of the report and then we also brought in some additional stakeholders to to get their perspective on the statement of task um, and understand kind of complementary work going on in other areas um, so the several of the upcoming meetings will also likely have um, these open sessions where we are inviting experts with either panels um, webinar type type events at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so if you're interested in these topics, um, we do, we're, we're very much um, happy for you to join um, and join, join the uh, activities of the committee when they're open to the public. Um, so then we go into a, uh, the report review process and then um, in the January 2022, um, we will have a pre-publication, which is we're presenting the report and its final content um, and without the glossy cover. Um, it's available online, and that's when we brief our sponsors and really begin disseminating the report. Um, and then the final report is um, will be delivered kind of by the end of March 2022. Uh, so this is our study committee. Um, we have 16 members uh, covering a very wide expertise needed to address the statement of task. Um, we've got, you know, folks from the oil and gas industry, um, shipping, transportation. Um, we've got the uh, folks from the state and federal level of um, response type activities um, and uh, folks doing, let's see, oil spill um, data analysis and um, uh, fate and transport modeling, particulation, um, yeah, pretty everything. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great committee. Um, and like I said, we just held our first meeting um, and we're working hard to, um, to develop the, the kind of scope and um, structure of, of, the, of the, this next report. Um, so I mentioned that we have lots of open sessions and we definitely will when we're do while we're doing this all virtually. Um, and so to stay up, with date, up to date on what's going on with oil in the sea, um, there's two things here. One is to connect with us. If you're not already a member of our um, lister for the Ocean Studies Board, um, you can enter your email here and then you'll be sure to get all the emails that go out um, announcing upcoming activities and registration links for the webinars. Um, and then also, um, we, and to the right, we have um, a box with our work. And so any of the any work that we're working on, um, whether it's a, a workshop or a report or anything is, is located here and you can click on it and go to the actual project website. Um, so that project website for Oil in the Sea is here. And this is where you can find information about the statement of task. Um, you can find more information about the committee members, their bios are all posted here. 
Um, you can find information about the upcoming events, um, webinar recordings from past events, agendas, registration links, all that kind of thing uh, is uh, located on this, on this site. Um, so yeah, I encourage you guys to, if you're not already uh, members of the Ocean Studies Board listserv to join um, and to uh, participate in our upcoming um, events you know, as, as appropriate. So um, that is kind of the real nutshell version of what we're doing. Um, you can, if you have any questions or comments, you can always email me um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the study. All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And folks, uh, start, start popping in the questions. Before we roll too far into the questions, since Tim is not here today, I feel it's my job then to respond to part of Susan's presentation, <laughs> as Tim would, <laughs> and particularly speaking to the WAFs. <laughs> so number one, I think the first thing Tim would argue is that there is never equilibrium in the ocean. It continually dilutes. So even when you break it down to these very small percentage uh, wafts, the oil droplets still redevelop an equilibrium in the water that's never actually there in the real ocean. So that would be one, one piece that would be a bit of a weakness. And then the second piece is there's been some subsequent stuff done, particularly looking at oil droplets treated with dispersants in a, in a water column with, with flow that replicates the bubble droplet uh, rise speed. And the show that fairly quickly, the dispersant is stripped from the droplet. And thus in the real world, once the drop, droplets are formed, more or less, there's not any dispersant left. The droplets go up, the dispersant gets dispersed laterally into the water column. And thus, when you do a container controlled WAF type test, you have dispersant stuck in the container at a much, much higher uh, concentration than you can see in the real world. And essentially, in the real world, once the oil droplet and the dispersant separate, you don't have any dispersant available with the remaining droplets are left behind. So I just felt I, I should say that for Tim's behalf, since Tim uh, <laughs> wasn't here. Yeah, Doug, and maybe I should have emphasized more that these are, you know, laboratory experiments and that, and that they don't replicate field conditions. So, and they're not, and I don't think they should be meant to replicate field conditions. It's really in a sense, you know, you're establishing um, sort of benchmarks for toxicity. And uh, I know there's been a lot of talk in some of the previous webinars about you know, using toxic units. Um, and that was one of the things that the report suggested was a, a good approach to really understand that. And part of that is, you know, recognizing that the chemistry of the oil changes over time as it dilutes in the environment. And so understanding, you know, if you take a water sample, you really have to be able to analyze what's in that water sample and then determine what the toxicity is to really assess the effect on the biota. Yeah. So really what, you know, to me, what the in C2 tests are doing, the laboratory tests are establishing those benchmarks. It's not necessarily saying that this is what's happening in the environment. It's telling you what's happening you know, sort of as, as a benchmark for toxicity that you can then go, you know, use when you do go out into the environment and understand what the concentrations are. Okay. Yeah, I think what Tim gets concerned with is people make conclusions based on what happens with those lab tests as if they're equivalent to the real world. Right. And so I think that does happen from time to time. And you're right. I mean, it's, it's, there's no way you're ever going to be able to truly replicate the real world in a small container in the lab. So, Correct. And, and that's just the facts of life. <laughs> All right. So we had uh, a comment more than a question from Roger Prince. And he says, the Ryerson figure really annoys him as a biologist. <laughs> So he says, all those significant figures, and yet only 60% of the oil assumed to go to the environment is accounted for. <laughs> kind of have the kind of has a point. <laughs> yeah, and I guess you know, my so hello, Roger. I guess my point is that I, I didn't actually talk about um, D, which is the figure that he's referencing there, which is yeah. you know trying to come up with a you know a total distribution, and uh, you know I know that that's a very difficult thing you know to to reconcile. Really, to me, what the point of the Ryerson, that particular Ryerson figure, was really how oil changes as it 
goes from um, the source at the at the wellhead to the surface. Yeah, no, I I, I get it. I, <laughs> I just thought I <laughs> that's I thought I'd try to inject a little humor here. <laughs> so we have a uh, another thing. Say, so I heard that there was some controversy around this report that some felt the report ignored some studies or that the report was more conclusive than it should be. Uh, can you address this? That's from an anonymous attendee. They didn't attach a name to it. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I think that's partially, you know, somewhat inevitable for any any report on a controversial topic, and certainly dispersants are, you know, a controversial topic. But I, you know, I think um, the committee, and certainly, you know, for the academies, we'd certainly welcome those conversations and questions. You know, I don't think that once the report's out, that that's the end of the story. And it's a, you know, in a sense, it's a, a marker in time, you know, in terms of our understanding of, of a particular issue. The other thing I'll mention is that our reports are consensus documents. So the committee has to reach agreement on um, what's in the report. Um, this report did have an appendix that two of the authors um, <laughs> wanted to include, but were not agreed upon by the rest of the committee. So I think that that sort of illustrates our consensus process quite well. And then the last thing I'll mention is that it goes through a very um, uh, intense review process. So anyone who served on one of our committees, and these are all volunteers, by the way, they don't get paid. Um, they do all their work as, um, you know, for, we used to say they worked for food because we could, you know, at meetings, we could, you know, take them out to dinner, but we don't even do that right now because it's all virtual. <laughs> Um, and we don't pay our reviewers either, but it does go through a very intense review process. So it's not just the committee's opinion, but they've also had to respond to these expert reviewers. And the reviews, we have a, almost as many reviewers as we do committee members. So we try to replicate the expertise of the committee in the reviewer pool. Yep, I, I agree. And something like this, especially with so many uh, different components to it, there's no way you can include everything and then sometimes you'll have the conclusions that the, the committee, you know, the can, comes to agreement on, and it's it's different than somebody else has, right? And then they feel unhappy, right? I mean, there's no way you can make everybody happy, but I think the process and you guys' way to go about it is the right way to do it. So you guys do a good job. I think that's it right now for the questions. And, and Ed Levine says, thank you for getting the word out. But... Uh, any other yeah, that's, questions? That, that's where our, you know, our current study on oil in the C4. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd really you know, sort of encourage everyone who's on the line now, you know, to follow the study. And um, certainly you can contact us if you have any questions about it or interested in joining any of the meetings. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, then we'll thank our speakers, all of them, for being here today. Oh, wait. Something else just popped up. Let me see. <laughs> oh, Tom Colbaugh says he looks forward to the work of the committee. All right, so we'll thank all of our speakers today for an excellent job on interesting topics and doing an excellent job of communicating their message. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and we appreciate everybody that was online to listen and everybody that asked questions. And we'll be back on again next week. And I used to say one of my favorite TV shows as a child, same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep. All right. Anybody else? Anything? Nope. So, all right. We can gain a little bit of our time back for the day and everybody uh, have a great week.